All right, we're going to look at 2 Peter chapter 2. This passage is about false prophets. The Bible predicted that in the last days there will be false prophets. Now, thankfully, the Christian church uh, does not go through the tribulation. We believe that we will be raptured before the tribulation. There are many scriptural evidences on that. However, as we approach closer to the tribulation, at the end times, the Bible says that at the end times, there has to be false prophets. That's important to understand. If we think that everybody, majority of people in churches nowadays, that uh, they're good people or that they love the Lord, you have to realize this. You have to be careful of that. The Bible says that the book of James, the devils also believe in God, but what they what? They tremble. That doesn't mean anything. Uh, the devil also used the scripture as well. The book of Matthew chapter 4 shows that Satan, when he tried to tempt Jesus, he used scripture. So it's important to understand just because a person uses scripture and a person believes there is a God does not make them biblical. You have to, how do we find out whether they're biblical or not? It's very simple. If their teaching does align with scripture. Well, doesn't the devil use scripture? Yes, that's why you have to make sure that when you read the scripture, that the person is not twisting scripture like the devil. That's the point. You have to search yourself. You have to study yourself. You can't just uh, believe whatever somebody says to you just because they quote something or they say something Christian. You have to look at the scripture and see for yourself if it's right or it's wrong. That's what makes, it, uh, that's what makes us a Bible-believing church in seeking the Bible as the final authority, as the only right an answer, not pastor statements or people's opinions. Now, the Bible says that in the tribulation there has to be majority, majority of false pastors rising. If that's the case, and what you're seeing right now, we're very close to end times. We're seeing crazy stuff that has never happened before with the coronavirus, with the Ukraine-Russia conflict. I mean, we've seen stuff that has never, ever happened before. I talked to so many preachers, and they said they never seen anything like it in all their lives. So there's no doubt we're close to the tribulation. But the thing is this, is that if we're getting closer to the tribulation, then that must mean there must be a greater rise of apostate preachers and churches. That's important to understand. That's important to understand. So here are the signs of a false pastor or a false prophet as we get closer to the tribulation. So this is what describes the last days. We're going to look at 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1, verse 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. For if God spare not the angels that sin, but cast them down to hell, and deliver them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Now notice right here that the Bible says at verse 1, there's false prophets arising. And the Bible says false teachers. And, there, and many are going to follow their errors. And these people are what? In verse 12, if you look at verse 12. But these as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed. Speak evil of the things that they understand not and shall utterly perish in their own corruption and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. So notice right here that these false preachers, that the signs, uh, one of their signs is that they will speak corrupt things, but they're going to make money off of it. All right, so then in 2 Peter chapter 2, and then verses 12 to 13, the Bible points out that there are people who are going to deceive them with evil words and then try to make money off of you. That's important to understand. You'll notice that in verse 19, 19, while they promise them liberty, 
They themselves are the servants of corruption. For whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. Now look at 18, verse 18. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, see that? So nice puffed up, puffed up words. They allure through the loss of the flesh. So through such nice words, they're going to attract the people. All right, that pleases their flesh, right? Through much wantonness, so that has to do with prosperity. Those that were clean escape from them who live in error. So notice that there is this type of prosperity preaching. Now there's a thing called prosperity gospel. For some of you who don't know, prosperity gospel is the type of preaching that you're going to hear in churches that God wants you wealthy, God does not want you to live in poverty. But, you know, that kind of preaching has uh, broken down a lot of people who are poor and who love Jesus and who serve God. Are you telling me that they're not right with the Lord then, poor people? Some of them actually say that. Some of them are big names that you probably heard about before that you would be in shock that they would say such things. So we're going to come across, I'm going to show you the top 10 most blasphemous statements that you've heard from pastors, okay? And this is real. This is not a joke. This is actually real on what they said. And you can't believe that these are the people who take the pulpit and preach to you. You wouldn't believe some of them. All right, the first person that some people don't know is, uh, or some people have heard about, he's become very famous. Ha almost half a million flock to Lakeland, Florida, or so they say, to hear a Canadian-born tele-evangelist. His name is Todd Bentley, Todd Bentley. This happened, I think, around 2008. But Todd Bentley, he's a very famous speaker. And Todd Bentley, he said this, which is very, uh, which is, some of it is just, Downright, you would think it's a comedy show, but it's actually, he meant it by seriously. Now, the televangelists and mega churches, they make a big deal about what they call signs and wonders. In other words, that they believe that they can heal people by just directly touching them. Now, we don't believe in healers. We believe in the healer, meaning Jesus Christ. So sometimes we pray for sick people, right? So that's why we pray for sick people to be healed. But we don't believe that a pastor has the power of God to heal the person. We don't believe in that. Signs and wonders is something from the first centuries of the church that's gone. Well, we, uh, there's plenty of Christians who are sick today, and we have to pray for. I mean, if uh, signs and wonders are working right now, then during the coronavirus, where were those churches, huh? They closed down church. I thought that they can heal everybody. Why do, they, uh, why do they have to go by the restrictions or even close down church then if they have the healing signs and wonders? I mean, the signs and wonders, you have to raise the dead in the Bible, not just a uh, little virus. <laughs> now, Todd Bentley, uh, his popularity imploded, especially when he left his wife for another woman. That's pretty infamous for some of you who didn't know that. But he actually said that when he was uh, trying to heal a woman, he claimed God told him to kick a woman so that he can heal her. This is what he says. And there is this old lady worshiping right in front of the platform. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. The gift of faith, faith came on me. He said, kick her in her face, he says. What in the world, man? I mean, you think this is of God? Besides, I never read in the Bible Jesus kicks somebody to heal somebody. So he, he's a poor imitation of Jesus Christ. Uh, you, can find, you can confirm some of these uh, cases online. You can search it. But this, uh, I'm reading an excerpt from the Christian Post, 10 crazy quotes from tele-evangelists, actually. So that's one from Todd Bentley, if you can believe that actually happened. Okay, so you know what's the scripture to disprove this? It's very simple. There is not even one scripture you can find of an apostle, Peter, James, John, or even Jesus Christ healing somebody by kicking them in the face. There is no, where do you find that in the scripture? I don't see that anywhere in the scripture. Where did he get that from? See, that's something strange. That's an unholy spirit. All right. The, this is a famous person uh, who was responsible for the famous 700 Club, Pat Robertson, Pat Robertson. Pat Robertson's still very, very famous. 
But Pat Robertson of the famous 700 Club, uh, he'll usually have his serv services where he'll tell the people to touch the TV screen and then he'll say, okay, I see that person who's getting healed of, you know, some sickness or leprosy or cancer or something like that. But, you know, it's too much of a stretch. But this one was really messed up. In one video, according to this excerpt, there was a, a, a husband who was going through the program with Pat Robertson and he actually said this, he advised the husband to divorce his wife that has Alzheimer's actually. So Robertson said, I know it sounds cruel, but if he's going to do something, he should divorce her and start all over again. So I don't know why he would give a silly, dumb advice like that, but he did. He told a husband to divorce his wife that was suffering Alzheimer's. That's just a... That's just a messed up thing to do. So why do televangelists do that? It's because they're so used to, uh, I don't know if you've heard of charismatic preachers. Charismatic, basically the charisma. Usually these preachers who have a lot of charisma, they're very good in speaking, so to speak. In other words, they're used to just speaking off the cuff. So what happens is because they're so used to giving speaking off the cuff, a lot of times they just say silly stuff that they don't even mean to say. And... When they're, especially when they're on television with millions of people watching, you know what they've done? Then they've damaged a lot of people's lives, if not their souls. So that's a horrible thing to do. So that's Pat Robertson. All right, the next one, famous person that you've heard of before, but uh, his name is Joel Osteen, Joel Osteen, known as the Smiling Preacher. So Joel Osteen, you wouldn't believe some of the stuff that he said. He is uh, probably uh, the w America's largest church today, and if not the world's most famous pastor. But Joel Osteen, he actually said some of these statements which were actually blasphemous, that you wouldn't believe that he did say these things. First of all, I want you to turn to uh, Philippians, Philippians chapter 4, Philippians chapter 4. I want you to go to Philippians 4, and then I'm going to give you some quotes from Joel Osteen. Philippians 4, and then the second place, I want you to go to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. All right, now, he said this. He actually taught people to have pride. He said that people should have pride in themselves. Wait, are you kidding me? Didn't the Bible say pride goeth before destruction? It did say that before, right? He said this, You can take pride in yourself without comparing yourself to anybody else. If you run your race and be the best that you can be, then you can feel good about yourself. Not the Apostle Paul. Look at Romans chapter 7. He says right here that in verse 18, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. Notice right here, Paul does not take pride in his own flesh. And that's a blasphemous statement from Joel Osteen, is to have pride in yourself. Well, you know... <laughs> He, did he read about the sin of pride? The Bible says that God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble, right? Then the Bible says these are six things the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination to him, and one of them is pride. What was Lucifer's sin? Remember Lucifer's sin? It was pride in himself. You don't want to teach stuff like that. But why does he teach stuff like that? That's how he gets a lot of people into church. That's how he can get, keep getting money. That's how he get, keeps getting fame. Here's another one. He says right here, God wants us to prosper financially, to have plenty of money, to fulfill the destiny he has laid out for us. Well, no, that's not true. If you look at Philippians chapter 4, Philippians chapter 4, notice that it's not... A lot of times the Lord, where he gives you prosperity, that's not his will all the time. 
You'll notice that Philippians chapter 4 and verse 11. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry. See that? Both to abound and to suffer need. Notice right here that Paul says that there are times the Lord's will is where, yeah, he may be successful, but there are times he is poor. See that? Hence, we see right here that Joel Osteen is wrong, is that God wants us to prosper financially. No, there are times that in God's will, he just wants you to be content, right? Verse 11 and 12, with the state that you're in, even if you're poor. We saw that at the passage there. So obviously, uh, Joel Osteen uh, taught wrong doctrine right there. He also says here concerning about word of faith. For some of you who don't know what word of faith is, that's a new age thing, which is pretty dangerous now. Basically, if you speak it out by faith, then it should happen to you. So I am successful, or I am wealthy, or I am victorious, or I am rich. So that's the reason why Oprah had him over at his show. Why? Why was a woman who is very anti-Bible inviting a guy like him over to her show? Because she's a New Age mindset herself. So Joel Osteen's teaching attracted her concept. That's why she invited him over. She had no problem with that. Why? Because that's that New Age stuff that makes you feel good. I am victorious. I, have, I am wealthy. I am beautiful or stuff like that. So he says this, the Bible says that we can grow in favor, said, Joel, said Osteen in his sermon, increasing in favor. I believe one of the main ways that we grow in favor is by declaring it. It's not enough just to read it. It's not enough to just believe it. You've got to speak it out. Your words have creative power. And one of the primary ways we release our faith is through our words. And there is a divine connection between you declaring God's favor and you seeing God's favor manifest in your life. You've got to give, uh, you've got to give life to your faith by speaking it out. So he's saying that if you want God's favor, you're supposed to say it. You're supposed to claim it. And there's a divine connection to that one. Well, the problem with that is if you... Uh, if you're talking about, all right, a divine connection to claim God's favor, okay, then we read Romans 7, right? What did Paul say? He said that, for I know that is in me in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. You talk about getting God's favor by speaking it out that way. <laughs> oh, uh, look at Romans 7, all right? L look at God's divine favor right here. This ain't God's divine favor. Look at Romans 7, Romans 7 and verse 24. Verse 24, Romans 7, verse 24. Notice that uh, Paul, he is not a good example of claiming God's divine favor here. It says right here, Romans 7, 24, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? You talk about claiming God's favor right there, huh? <laughs> they ain't claiming God's favor right there. Where, where did he get that from? Like uh, claiming the money, claiming the favor, claiming prosperity. That's a word of faith thing. And then he's deceiving a lot of people where they're trying to believe it and claim it. Let me show you another one. Go to 2 Corinthians 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Guess what? Paul tried to claim God's favor. And didn't you know that God actually said no? So I'm going to show you right here that God actually said no to God's favor. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, notice at verse 7, verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. Now look at this, Paul, he requested God's favor to remove that thorn in the flesh from Satan, all right? He believed it, he prayed, his heart was right, but look at this, God said no, verse 9, and he said unto me, 
my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in prosperity, in money, in... No, it's the opposite. I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities. Necessities, that means he doesn't have the money. He doesn't have the favor. In persecutions in distresses for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then am I strong. See, the, notice that this word of faith is anti-Bible. It's anti-biblical. Paul, he uh, used the word of faith, and he believed it. He prayed for it, but look, God said no. There are times that God will say no. Now, don't get me wrong. There are times that God will say yes, okay? And you should believe that God can provide all your needs, and yeah, God can bless you. You you better believe in that. God can do that. But God does not answer yes all the time. And if you pray for years, you know that's true. There are times that God will say yes, but let's be honest, if you prayed for a long time, there are times God will say no. Why? Because God knows what's best for you. God knows what's better for you. Sometimes uh, we don't know what's best for ourselves because we want to please our flesh, don't we? That's the problem. We want to please our flesh. Look at James 4, James chapter 4. Now look at this. Claim it, word of faith. No, that's nonsense. Then you're pleasing your flesh. And God doesn't like that. And actually God can answer no if you look at James chapter 4. James chapter 4. Now this is ridiculous. Look what he says right here. Now this is Joel Osteen in speaking faith-filled words at tape number 223, Daystar Television, May 2nd, 2004. He said this, You can cancel out God's plan by speaking negative words. <laughs> what in the world? You cancel God's plan? No, God's plan is still working. God's plan is no, <laughs> okay? Your no doesn't cancel out God's plan. If God says yes on something, He'll say yes even if you say no. And if there's something you want to say yes on something, guess what? God can do the opposite and say no. You can't cancel out God's plan. Look at right here, James 4 and verse 3. Ye ask, right? You ask the Lord and what? Receive not. Isn't that what it said? What happened to speaking, speaking faith-filled words? What happened to that one? Ye ask and receive not. Why? Because ye ask amiss that ye may what? Consume it upon your lust. See, it's because of that prosperity thing. You want to feel good. You got to watch out for that one. You got to watch out for that one. So this is utter heresy. So Joel Osteen, so he doesn't know what he's talking about. All right, number seven. Number seven, who we're going to be covering. His name is Rob Bell. Rob Bell. So who is Rob Bell? Rob Bell, he's at, let's see right here. Is it uh, Rob Bell that I have over here? Yeah. So Rob Bell, he actually is the famous pastor that started the Mars Hill Church, for some of you who've heard about it. Uh, the Mars Hill Church is a very famous movement and church work. Now, the, you got to watch out for a group called the Emergent Church Movement. Emergent Church Movement. If you ever heard of that term, you, you got to run away. That's one of the worst church, churches to get involved with. They mingle a lot with New Age stuff. But Marshall Church is a very famous church. Rob Bell, he said a lot of ridiculous stuff. He denies Scripture alone. He denies Scripture alone. you got to realize this is a pastor... Pr a pastor's job is to preach from the what? The Bible. How can a pastor preach and do his job if he rejects the book that he's supposed to preach out of and that's supposed to be his job? He's not a pastor. He has a book titled, look how Christian this sounds, Velvet Elvis, page 68. That's the title of his book, see? He's a pastor. You've got to be kidding me. He says this, It wasn't until the 300s that what we know as the 66 books of the Bible were actually agreed upon as the Bible. 
This is part of the problem with continually insisting that one of the absolutes of the Christian faith must be a belief that Scripture alone is our guide. It sounds nice, but it is not true. In reaction to abuses by the church, a group of believers during a time called the Reformation claimed that we only need the authority of the Bible. But the problem is that we got the Bible from the church voting on what the Bible even is. Whoa! What's he... <laughs> See that? So when I affirm the Bible as God's Word, in the same breath I have to affirm that when those people voted, God was somehow present, guiding them to do what they did. When people say that all we need is the Bible, it is simply not true. In affirming the Bible as inspired, I also have to affirm the Spirit who I believe was inspiring those people to choose those books. All right, so that's on his book, Velvet Elvis, uh, page 68. So he denies Scripture alone. No, that's ridiculous nonsense. Okay, go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And then I want you to go to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And I want you to go to 2 Peter chapter 1. So it sounds like here that he's claiming that there should be people involved who speak out for you on what the Scripture should mean. So that's why we can't really go by Scripture alone. No, that's not true. The Bible says otherwise. So let's look at 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20. 20. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of what? Any private interpretation. Is that what the Bible says? So notice that the Bible says that the Scriptures themselves, it's not private interpretation dictated by men. For the prophecy came not in old time by the what? Will of man. That's very plain. Man is not the dictator of the scripture, Scriptures. But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. God is the author. Yes, we believe God uses men, and we believe in that, but men aren't the final authority. So then for the guy to say that we, I can't believe the Bible, uh, only the Bible alone should dictate our practices because there were men involved. No, he's got to believe in it because why? Even though there were men involved, the Bible says that those were merely tools. All right, they weren't the final authority. God himself is the one. His word is final authority. But he uses people to somehow, to what? To transmit it. I mean, let's be honest. Come on, guys. Like, uh, if, if there's an author of a book, he's going to entrust some publishing or printing companies to print out and uh, spread out the books for him, right? See, whether, so it doesn't change the fact the author is the author of the book, but that doesn't mean he doesn't use other people to spread out the words. I mean, uh, the, the nonsense, the sheer nonsense of it. All right, let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Let's look at verse 16. All scripture. Now, you see that? It says all scripture, correct? So it's not some or most, it says all. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. All right, inspiration, for some of you who don't know, that means God breathed, God breathed. So uh, every single part in our Bible, we believe that God breathed on it. Those are his words, it's not man. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be what? Perfect, truly furnished unto all, does it say all good works? Yes, it says all. So the scripture is sufficient alone for us. That's what the passage points out. Otherwise, God is lying in his book. So this guy is not, a pa is not really a pastor like he thinks he is. Now, this, one, here's another blasphemous statement. He said that hell is full of forgiven people. Wait a minute, isn't hell a place where people are not forgiven for their sins and damned because they reject the salvation in Christ? He says hell is full of forgiven people, though. <laughs> this is on his same book, Velvet Elvis, page 146. Heaven is full of forgiven people. Hell is full of forgiven people. Uh, 
Heaven is full of forgiven people. Hell is full of forgiven people. Heaven is full of people God loves, whom Jesus died for. Hell is full of forgiven people God loves, whom Jesus died for. The difference is how we choose to live, which story we choose to live in, which version of reality we trust, ours or God's. You see that, what he's doing? Basically, heaven and hell, what he's trying to... Uh, I mean, I don't know what this quote is implying, but it seems to imply right here that heaven and hell is basically our choices in life. So in other words, heaven and hell is here on earth, so to speak. So I don't know if that's what he meant, but you notice that this kind of weird, uh, nonsensical statements from these pastors are all from a charismatic point of view or an emergent point of view or some kind of spiritualism point of view, but it's not scriptural. They don't do it from the Bible. You've got to watch out for this. Another one. Uh, so this is, okay, this is ridiculous. He says, uh, another blasphemous statement from this man. He says that God chooses to have faith in us, so we should have faith in ourselves too. <laughs> Who does Peter uh, quote from his book, page 133 to 134? Who does Peter lose faith in? Not Jesus. He is doing fine. Peter loses faith in himself. <laughs> what? No, Peter lost faith in Christ. What's he talking about right here? Peter loses faith that he can do what his rabbi is doing. If the rabbi calls you to be his disciple, then he believes that you can actually be like him. As we read the story of Jesus' life with his uh, Talmudim, his disciples, what do we find, frustrates him to no end. When his disciples lose faith in themselves, notice how many places in the accounts of Jesus' life he gets frustrated with his disciples because they are incapable? No, because of how capable they are. He sees what they could be and could do, and when they fall short, it provokes him to no end. It isn't their failure that's the problem, it's their greatness. <laughs> They don't realize what they are capable of. God has an amazingly high view of people. God believes that people are capable of amazing things. I've been told I need to believe in Jesus, which is a good thing. But what I'm learning is that Jesus believes in me. God has faith in me. He didn't know. Look at Romans 3. Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. That is heresy. Look at Romans chapter 3. That is heresy. If we're going to be very honest, we know what you and I are capable of, sin. You and I are capable of sin, and it's only by the mercy and love of God that's why we are what we are today. To put our faith in ourselves, then Jesus Christ, that is blasphemous. Look at Romans chapter 3. Look at verse 9. What then? Are we better than they? Why? Rob Bell would say yes, right? No in no wise. See, no, we're, we're, we're just as bad. For we have before proved, both Jews and Gentiles, that they are what? All under sin. We're all sinners. Yeah. We're all sinners. Oh, yeah. uh, no one is good. No one is good. Did they miss out a lot of what I just said on the mic? Okay, then. The Bible says right here, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Wow, look at that. You, you sure want to believe in yourself after that, right? There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of ass is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. A lot of... A lot of capability you have a lot of confidence in human nature don't you after that uh, verse 17 and the way of peace have they not known there is no fear of God before their eyes now we know that now we know that what things soever the law saith is saith to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God now notice right here the Bible says that God uses the law to show how rotten we are in our sins. Why? So that we can shut our mouths. Why? Because our mouth says a lot of good about ourselves. But God says, no, let's shut your mouth and show you how bad you are. And you go, oh. So then how dare these preachers, not people, preachers, 
tell these people to open their mouths and say good things about themselves. That contradicts Scripture. The Bible says, no, the mouth should be stopped, pointing out how wretched and rotten our sinful condition is. We have to realize that. Why? Because when we compare ourselves to holy God, we got to realize that we're nothing. So I'm not telling you to be depressed and keep talking about bad things about yourself, obviously. But the point is, is that we can't take this notion, this mindset of using our mouth to always talk about good, about human nature and human flesh. And that's the tendency of this world where it's heading toward. That's why the Lord puts it down the drain right here. Because human nature has so much pride on their flesh. And that's a sign of pride, not humility. God wants, what, a humble heart. A humble heart realizing, I am nothing, what, without Jesus Christ. It's because of Jesus Christ that I gain the glory and the blessing. Not because of me, 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 me. You know, all, all of it is about you. And that's a selfish generation and mindset. And pastors who preach and teach that ought to be ashamed of themselves. They don't know what they're talking about. All right. Uh, I forgot to give another one from Joel Osteen, but this is from his book, Your Best Life Now, Seven Steps to Living at Your Full Potential. He said, you have to learn to follow your heart. You can't let other people pressure you into being something that you're not. If you want God's favor in your life, you must be the person he made you to be, not the person your boss wants you to be. Why? You notice that right here? He says to follow your heart. Is that a good thing to go by? Go to the book of Jeremiah. Why? We know what the Bible says about the heart, right? In the book of Jeremiah. The heart is deceitful. Jeremiah 17. Jeremiah 17. Follow your heart. He's not following the Bible. There's no doubt Osteen is trying to follow his own heart on what he's saying. Look at Jeremiah chapter 17. Look what the Bible shows right here. Don't you dare follow your heart. It's deceitful. <laughs> Verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? You don't know, so don't you try. Don't you dare try it, okay? Don't pretend that you do know and try it out. You don't know what you're talking about. All right, the next uh, blasphemous statement is from Brian McLaren. Brian McLaren. All right, Brian McLaren is the one responsible for the emergent church movement. So he's a big name amongst the emergent church movement group. So let's see some of the quotes he says right here. One of the most blasphemous statements that he said was that Christianity is not true in every aspect. <laughs> so here's his quote. It's from his book, A Generous Orthodoxy. Uh, version is 2004, page 296. Sit down here next to me in this little restaurant and ask me if Christianity, my version of it, yours, the Pope's, whoever's, is orthodox, meaning true. And here's my honest answer. A little, but not yet. Assuming by Christianity, you mean the Christian understanding of the world and God, Christian opinions on soul, text, and culture. I have to say that we probably have a couple of things right, but a lot of things wrong, and even more sprints before it is unseen and unimagined. What in the world? See, you know what this is? This is the emergent church movement. It's the church emerging itself with the world. That's the idea. So you notice that heresy right here that he's saying that uh, Christianity, a lot of things is wrong about it. No. What in the world is he talking about? Let's look at the book of Acts. Let's see what the early church thought about Christians. Look at the book of Acts. And look at Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. Let's just say that the Christians are wrong, all right? Then what does the Bible have to say about this? In verse 26, and when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people, and the disciples were called what? Christians first in Antioch. Okay, what did the Bible commend them on of what they learned as Christians? I'll tell you what points out. It says right here at verse 23, Who, when he came 
and had seen the grace of God was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. You notice that right there? In verse 26, it says, the church taught much people. Do you see that? So notice that the word of God commends them for what the Christian church teaches. So what does that mean that uh, everything that they teach is wrong? No, it points out right here that you got to listen to the teachings, Christian teachings. Not think that, oh, most of it is wrong and some of it is right. No, the Bible says you should heed to that. The Holy Ghost was actually in there at verse 24. You look at verse 24, the Holy Ghost was in that. I wouldn't reject the Holy Ghost if I were you, man. Oh, this is ridiculous. This is on page 74. He apologizes for using masculine pronouns to describe God. <laughs> Can you believe that? This is what he says. This is as good a place as any to apologize for my use of masculine pronouns for God in the previous sentence. You'll notice that whenever I, uh, wherever I can, I avoid the use of masculine pronouns for God because they can give the false impression to many people today that the Christian God is a male deity. Well, of course he is. What is this doofus thinking? He ain't a pastor. God is a he. Oh my, uh, okay, let's go to Genesis 1, shall we? Let's look at Genesis 1, all right? God is a he, all right? He doesn't know what he's talking about. He don't read scripture. Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. Look at verse 26. Look at verse 26. And God said, let us make man, right? He said, man in our what? In our image. All right. Look at verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Notice right here, verse 27, the Bible says, man is created in God's image. But what? The fem uh, when it comes to the female, it's what? He just created them, male and female he created. But for man specifically is in his own image, verse 27. But uh, let's look at a different one. We'll go to the book of Numbers, chapter 23. Numbers 23, verse 19. Numbers 23, verse 19. Notice right here that God is a male gender. God is likened to male gender. Why, why would you apologize for something like that? I don't see Moses apologizing for that. <laughs> Let's see how Moses apologized at Numbers 23. Verse 19. God is not a what? Man that what? He should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken and shall he not make it good? So notice right here that God is male. God is male. The author Moses saw God as male. Let's look at the book of Mark 9. Mark 9. He said this, uh, hell is not literal. Can you believe that? I don't literally believe what he says. Fourth, we should consider the possibility that many and perhaps even all of Jesus' hellfire or end of the universe statements refer not to post-mortem judgment, but to the very historic consequences of rejecting his kingdom message of reconciliation and peacemaking. The destruction of Jerusalem in AD 67 to 70 seems to many people to fulfill much of what we have traditionally, traditionally understood as hell. Are you kidding me? <laughs> this guy don't read scripture, man. Uh, this guy don't read scripture. Let's uh, look at uh, this example. Go to Mark 9. Okay, let's see what Jesus thought about hell, all right? Let's see if Jesus thought of it as a historical interpretation. Look at verse 43. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Look, it has fire. Hell has fire. It's not the destruction of Jerusalem. Not only that, it's better to enter life, to be crippled in life, than two hands going to hell. Why? This is not your average everyday historical event, Jerusalem, destruction of Jerusalem. This is something else then. 
Verse 44, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Why, that don't sound like destruction of Jerusalem to me. That's eternal. Notice that's an eternal place. 45, and if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Jesus repeats again, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Look at that. This is pretty serious. I don't think it's talking about destruction of Jerusalem. So Brian McLaren is a heretic and he does not know what he's talking about. He does not know what he's talking about. You got to watch out for these heretics. Uh, they, they're rising out. They're rising out, deceiving people, and you can't fall for their nonsense and for their shenanigans. But it's uh, sad that many people listen and watch uh, what these people say and do, and then they'll even say amen to it. It's kind of, it's really sad. They actually say amen to this kind of nonsense. You might say, why would they do that? Because they don't read the scripture. It's that simple. Sometimes you have to ask yourself, do you read the scripture? Do you attend a Bible-believing church, a church that teaches a scripture, or is it just uh, cookies and cream and a little devotional? If you live that kind of a life, then you're not going to grow in the Lord, and the Lord's not going to really bless you. And not only that, you will get deceived. You will get deceived by liars out there. You have to watch out for a lot of false prophets and wolves. Uh, if you look at Matthew 7, the Bible warns you of that. Go to Matthew chapter 7. It's sad. So many people fall for this nonsense. Go to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. All right. The fifth person is Robert Schuller. Robert Schuller. His, fam his famous Crystal Cathedral Church. By the way, you know what happened to that church? It's nothing now. It became a Catholic church now. So he lost that church. Shows the Lord's hand of blessing was not on him after that. He lost it all. All right, before I give you his quote, look what the Bible warns in Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. Beware of false prophets which come to you in ship, sheep's clothing. See that? They're supposed to come to you like an innocent sheep. Say nice stuff. Say Christian stuff. But the Bible warns, but inwardly they are what? Ravening wolves. See, they destroy people. They destroy people's lives. Okay, so Robert Schuller, this is what he said. You, you couldn't believe some of the ridiculous stuff he said. So he says that uh, a Muslim grand mufti was, quote, truly one of the great Christ-honoring leaders of faith. <laughs> this guy don't know what he's talking about, man. It was from the San Francisco uh, uh, Harper 2001, printed by them. Robert Schuller's uh, writing, My Journey, page 502. Here's another one, what he says. This is so messed up. He says to be, uh, what is sin? You ever know what sin is? This is what he defines it as. From his book, Self-Esteem, The New Reformation, page 14. Sin is any act or thought that robs myself or another human being of his or her self-esteem. What? Really? So that's an act of sin, is that you rob your self-esteem? What happened to Romans chapter 7? For I know that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Sin. For why? Sin is in me, Paul mentions right over here. <laughs> so uh, he just contradicted scripture at Romans 7 that we read. Uh, you know what he thinks hell is? <laughs> uh, page 14 through 15 of his book, Self-Esteem. A person is in hell when he has lost his self-esteem. Oh, seriously? When he lost his self-esteem? No, I'll show you a person who had a lot of self-esteem but went to hell. Go to Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14. That, that guy does not know what he's talking about. You don't burn in hell because you don't have self-esteem. You go to hell simply because you reject the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation. It's that simple. It has nothing to do with being depressed or losing self-esteem or self-worth. Isaiah 14, 12. Look at this self-esteem right here, okay? He went to hell for his self-esteem, not because he lost self-esteem. Isaiah 14, 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which disweakened the nation? For thou hast said in thine heart, look at this self-esteem. 
I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the most high. So, according to Robert Schuller, then, he shouldn't be in hell then if he has self-esteem, right? Wrong. Verse 15, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Look at that. He went to, uh, this guy went to hell because of this so much self-esteem that he put on himself. <laughs> what do you mean you go to hell because you lose your self-esteem? That contradicts scripture. You don't read scripture. Okay, you know what is the gospel to him? <laughs> you, you won't believe it. Uh, in his same book, page 58. What is the gospel? You know what the gospel is to him? You could probably guess it, what the gospel is to him. Tell people everywhere that God wants all of us to feel good about ourselves. <laughs> That's the gospel to him. Like, uh, you know what the gospel is? Showing a person how to be saved from hell and how Christ died, buried, and resurrected to save them, to take them to heaven. That's the gospel. Feeling good about yourself. What, what nonsense is that? All right. So what do you think he born again means to him, right? You can guess what born again means to him. On page 68, the same book, to be born again means that we must be changed from a negative to a positive self-image, from inferiority to self-esteem, from fear to love, from doubt to trust. This guy don't know any Bible, man. This guy don't know any Bible. This guy is a joker. This guy is a joker. He is something else, man. All right, four. Jesse Duplantis. Jesse Duplantis. Now, he's a charismatic preacher, mega pastor, part of the prosperity gospel movement, always trying to get people to give money, money, money. So you got to watch out for these preachers. I showed you a 2 Peter chapter 2. Hopefully, I'm not out of bounds, if you can double-check the camera. So... In 2 Peter 2, remember, watch out for these pastors who try to grab money off of you, right? Well, Jesse, Jesse Duplantis is one of those guilty parties, and he believes in the prosperity gospel uh, nonsense. He tries to rip people off their money by saying this. This is on the November 1997 Voice of the Covenant magazine, page 5. The very first thing on Jesus' agenda was to get rid of poverty. What, really? <laughs> Would you like to know why some people, including ministries, never get out of poverty? Well, please tell me. It's not because they aren't smart. It's not because they don't have windows of opportunity. It's because they're not anointed. What? If you're not anointed, poverty will follow you all the days of your life. His first objective was to get rid of poverty. Are you kidding me? So he's claiming you're not anointed by the Holy Spirit. God's hand is not on you. You're not, the, the Holy Spirit, is His anointing is not on you if you're poor. Nonsense. Okay, go to 1 John. Do you think John was wealthy and rich? We, do you know what happened to the Apostle John? I'll tell you what happened. He got exiled to the Isle of Patmos. Doesn't sound like a wealthy guy to me. But you know what John said? He said that uh, those receipt, those who are believers in Christ... For who abide in Christ, they receive the anointing. All right, look at 1 John. You notice how anti-scriptural they are. 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. Verse 27. 1 John chapter 2, verse 27. Let me ask you this. Do you think John was writing to rich people? <laughs> verse 27. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you. See that? It abides in you. And ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things and is truth and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. How about that? That verse says the anointing abides in you and no man should teach you otherwise. And it's not a lie. Jesse Duplantis is a liar then and he taught otherwise. We all receive the anointing. That's what the passage pointed out. But he says, no, you don't have the anointing if you're poor. <laughs> John, he wasn't a wealthy millionaire, I bet you, when he was exiled and persecuted. What's he talking about? 
So you got to watch out for these preachers trying to rip people off of their money and then trying to take advantage of poor people. It's just a horrible thing to do. All right, number three is Benny Hinn. Benny Hinn. Benny Hinn, he, I think he renounced the prosperity gospel, but lately he's still been going onwards. And then the reason why he renounced it is because his nephew exposed him, actually. His own nephew exposed Benny Hinn of what he did. So Benny Hinn said that, okay, I changed my mind and stuff like that. But uh, he's still going on with his ministry, and there are some inklings of it where he's trying to take advantage still, which is very sad. So the prosperity gospel is wickedness, is nonsense. And Benny Hinn, he's done a lot of damage on that. He's done a lot of damage on that. Uh, he, this, is, this is a stupid thing to say. He said this, I'm sick and tired of hearing about streets of gold. I don't need gold in heaven. Well, who says that, man? What guy, only a demon-possessed guy would say something like that. Who would say that? I got to have it now, he says. I mean, when I get to glory, all my bills will be paid, brother. I won't have bills in glory. I won't need to worry about bills in glory. I got to have it here. You say, well, Benny Hinn, isn't that wonderful to have gold streets in glory? Well, of course, but if I hear the thing one more time of how it will be and how it was, I'm going to kick somebody. This guy, you know why? Because he's focusing so much on riches of this earth more than the riches up in glory. That's why. So that's why he gets upset about that. He's like, no, no, no. We got to think about the riches here on earth, not up in glory. Of course, we're going to have riches here on earth. No, Bible says otherwise. Go to Colossians 3. Colossians 3. Notice how anti-scriptural these people are. They contradict so many verses in our Bible. Colossians 3. Colossians chapter 3. The Bible says that the affection should be on above, not on the earth. But Benny Hinn has his affection on earth, not on above. Colossians 3, uh, verse 2. Set your affection on things what? Above, not on things on the earth. Oh, but Benny Hinn says, I'll kick somebody for putting your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. What kind of a madman is he? He doesn't know what he's talking about. His wife said this, which is so stupid. Uh, but that's what happens with charismatic speakers. You got to watch out. Sometimes you'll say stupid stuff. So this is what his wife said. So his wife, Suzanne, once told churchgoers, if your engine is not revving up, you know what you need? A Holy Ghost enema right up your rear end because God won't tolerate it. What in the... Okay, see, so these people, you notice that? The way that because they're so used to speaking freely and the amping up people, then they just say stupid stuff that they regret saying. And then you can't take it back. It's just nonsense what some of these people are. Uh, this is what Benny Hinn said, which is actually kind of hilarious. So uh, he, Benny Hinn wants to kill his critics so badly, so he got so angry that one time he said that, Sometimes I wish God would give me a Holy Ghost machine gun. I'd blow your head off. Because he was so angry one time. So These guys are wackos, man. These, I'm telling you, this is true stuff. They actually say this kind of weird nonsense. So Now you would say, can it get any worse than number three, right? Can it get any worse than number three? Yes, it does get worse than number three, okay? It can get worse than number three. You won't believe some of these people. Let me know if I'm cut off, all right? Number two, he's still kicking, and he's probably the wealthiest pastor, all right? Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Copeland. This guy is one of the worst that you'll ever come across. Please, please do not give this guy money. He is a thief, this guy. He is a thief, and he is unashamed to call himself a billionaire. He said that. I mean, it's so nonsensical. He actually said that, that uh, I am a billionaire. Uh, Copeland said, I am a billionaire because the assignment that the Lord gave me. He said, I want you to begin to confess the billion flow. Shamelessly, he tells his old people, I'm a billionaire. My goodness. I mean, how can he be so unashamed about that? That's just so... 
What about these prosperity preachers who make money off of people? He has no shame about that. He could care less. He said that uh, God is, uh, he said this, is that uh, Satan conquered Jesus. That's what he teaches. So Satan conquered Jesus. He said, Satan conquered Jesus on the cross and took his spirit to the dark regions of hell. So that's found on uh, his reference Bible, actually, believe it or not. It's still there. I don't know why he would write that. Uh, Kenneth Copeland, Holy Bible, Kenneth Copeland Reference Edition from Kenneth Copeland Ministries. You can tell he's a very humble guy. Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Copeland. 1991, page 129. He also said this, God is the biggest failure in the Bible. Can you believe that? Uh, he says this, I was shocked when I found out who the biggest failure in the Bible actually is. The biggest one is God. I mean, he lost his top-ranking, most anointed angel, the first man he ever created, the first woman he ever created, the whole earth and all the fullness therein, a third of the angels at least. That's a big loss, man. Now, the reason you don't think of God as a failure is he never said he's a failure, and you're not a failure till you say you're one. <laughs> this, this guy is messed up. This is found in his Praise-a-thon program on TBN, April 1988. So... But there's a lot of nonsense. This New Age stuff about finding deity in you. All right. Uh, Kenneth Copeland goes off on that. In the, uh, the Force of Love, in his audio tape number 2-0028, side 1, he says this. You don't have a God in you. You are one. So he claims that you guys are gods. He says this at Believer's Voice of Victory broadcast, July 9th, 1987. He said this, when I read in the Bible where he says, I am, right? I am is a holy title that's only given to God, right? I just smile and say, yes, I am too. This guy is full of the devil, man. This guy was totally messed up. He is totally full of the devil himself. That's why I do not like uh, Kenneth Copeland. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, it's a horrible testimony that sitcom and comedian, uh, uh, comedian uh, show talkers that they, were, that they would expose these mega church pastors, all right? And actually, I commend them for doing that. They're left-wing, they're liberal, they're, they're totally messed up themselves, but I'll have to be honest, it was refreshing exposing these mega church pastors because they just ruined our testimony in front of the whole left-wing, liberal, messed up world, the atheist, unbelieving world. So there were some unbelievers. John Oliver, he has a show. It's a lot of views, actually. One of the, his most views is mega church pastors, actually, which is a bad testimony on Christian's part, right? But uh, in one of those videos, it was hilarious. He wanted to test out Kenneth Copeland Ministries because they're supposed to give a gift if you give a love offering to them. So he said, so we want to test it out. So we gave him $1. So he mailed him $1 to Kenneth Copeland. So Kenneth Copeland ministry, they had to send him a gift. But they sent a letter saying, you know, like if you really gave to the Lord, if this is really your everything to the Lord, we know you can give more to the Lord. And then so what they did was they sent $2 to him. <laughs> and then so Kenneth Copeland's ministry sent him another letter saying, okay, now I know you're joking. You're messing around. So. But uh, I'm telling you what, it's a bad testimony. But uh, that did happen. All right, what's the worst? Okay, you, you would say, does it get any worse? Well, yeah, this is the worst. And this is the most, <laughs> this is the craziest statement ever stated. It was also mo one of the most infamous it's from Mike Murdoch. Mike Murdoch. The most whacked out statement that, you, that you'll probably ever hear from this guy right here, Mike Murdoch, he said this, is that <laughs> God will erase a donor's credit debt if he or she will donate with a credit card. <laughs> He said this, as you use your faith, God is going to wipe out your credit card debts, he said. 
What in the world? Okay, you know what these are? Wolves. They just want to rip off of poor people's lives and get their money. If you watch that video from John Oliver, it's very sad when he exposed mega church pastors. There was a woman suffering cancer, and she kept giving her money to that church, believing that because she would send money, she would be healed, because they believe in that prosperity gospel, that healing nonsense. And guess what? She still is in the hospital sick with cancer and tubes all over her, and the daughter is crying. And, she, and the whole testimony of Christianity is ruined as she's crying in front of a John Oliver show. Now, these are wolves, and these are people, I mean, if they have a conscience, if they are ever saved, which I don't know from this kind of wickedness that they have in their lives, this kind of demonic influence, I mean, the Lord judged them for that. And the Bible shows you something actually scary about this at 2 Peter 2. If you look at 2 Peter chapter 2, sometimes people who know the Bible, who know the Word of God, they are in worse danger than unbelievers. Sometimes it's better to be an unbeliever than a person who has knowledge of Christianity but is living like the devil and is even lost. Look at verse 20. Uh, we'll look at verse 20. For, 2 Peter 2.20. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. Who are these people? The ones at verse 18. Those preachers. Verse 1. Those false preachers. Verse 1 and verse 18. False preachers taking advantage of people's lives and money. It's horrible. It's just awful. So from the pits of hell, this, these are the te top 10 most blasphemous statements that I ever, crazy, whacked out statements I ever heard in my life. And you got to watch out for those preachers out there. The Bible warned about that. And trust me, it will get worse. And guess what? They have a lot of people watching them, subscribe to them, and in their church. Sad. God, my Father, I pray that tonight's teaching uh, showed us about how wicked this world is with this even pastors and churches falling away help us to be careful of this and not to go with the majority flow where they follow the false words that please the lust of the flesh how the eyes and minds of people have been blinded from your book we need to read the bible when's the last time we picked up that book and read it when's the last time we attended a bible believing church not just a church but a bible believing church so we can spiritually grow on the Word of God. I pray that you'll please help us to do so. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.